everybody and welcome to today's interview with Clean Room Technology Magazine. Today I am speaking to a global technical consultant from Ecolab Life Sciences, Matt Coakley. Matt has been with the company for over a decade and his focus at the moment is with um, making sure the correct use of biocides and other cleaning equipment. So sure very relevant to today's situation. So Matt, nice to meet you. How is he going? Hi, hi Sophie. <laughs> and so I'll just jump right in. So what are the current methods of disinfectant validation that are available for use? Okay, so that depends really if it's validation that's performed by disinfectant manufacturers or whether it's um, validation that's being performed by end users. So uh, within Europe, for example, disinfectant manufacturers tend to register their products with the, or tend to, they will register their products with the Biocidal Products Regulation, uh, BPR. And for that, we have the data that's submitted in a dossier, and that's to make sure it's safe for use, it's safe for the environment, and it has a demonstrable uh, efficacy. Um, and in order to demonstrate that efficacy, um, the manufacturers will use European norms, so EN test methods. Um, because they're robust, they're well designed, uh, they have good controls, and they're, and they're widely recognized. Um, and there are different EN test methods depending on the type of industry in which a, a disinfectant is used. Uh, the situation is slightly different. Uh, in North America, so under the Federal Insecticide, uh, Fungicide and Rodenticide Act, so that's FIFRA, um, the Environmental Protection <laughs> Agency, so the EPA, uh, registers chemical disinfectants that are marketed in North America. Um, but again, manufacturers supply information on uh, the use dilution of those disinfectants, the spectrum and the contact time, and it has similar aims in terms of making sure those products are, are safe and they're effective to use. But uh, to register under EPA, uh, manufacturers are using uh, AOAC or ASTM test methods. Um, but again, they are widely recognized methods. Um, difference as well in the US is those products are registered with EPA as, as cleaners or sanitizers or disinfectants or sporocytes. There are different categories depending on the efficacy that's demonstrated. Mm -hmm. So seeing it from more of a regulatory perspective, as you said, um, what is expected of the end user with regard to their disinfectant validation? Okay, well, that's fairly clear, actually. Um, the validation um, that is required, really, to demonstrate the, the suitability um, uh, for the disinfectant to reduce the types and the numbers of microorganisms in your own facility on the surface material types that are present in your own facility to an acceptable level. In other words, um, suitable for your clean room grade. Um, I think actually the latest Annex 1 draft version 12 that came out in February uh, 2020 um, was, was really clear on that, summarizes it nicely, that validation studies should demonstrate the suitability and effectiveness in the specific manner in which disinfectants are used. Um, so actually really there we can see the validation is not just some abstract laboratory test, um, what you're trying to do is mimic the way you use a disinfectant. So in terms of the application methods, the contact times you're using, those type of things. And really it's to make sure that as an end user, you have confidence uh, and you could also demonstrate to a regulator, of course, uh, that your disinfectant is suitable to maintain control within your clean room. And that's not really a new idea. There's been guidance documents out there for a while. So for example, the FDA guidance for industry, um, for sterile drug products produced by aseptic processing trying to think of that that was in 2004 we also have the PICS recommendation on the validation of aseptic uh, aseptic processes that's 2011 um, said very similar things around that um, and really it, it's no different we need to think in the same way as most aspects of pharmaceutical or life sciences manufacture the regulations really uh, require that the processes we use and in this case we're talking about disinfection um, are robust they're reliable and reproducible we, and we have the data basically to demonstrate that. So with regard to the test methods, which should manufacturers use for validation and also can they modify the parameters of the method to fit their process? Yeah, yeah. so um, I think it's a really important point which is that end users are actually under no obligation to use any specific method or strategy uh, to validate the disinfectants they use. I think sometimes people are surprised by that. But as I've mentioned, the, you know, the test method should be representative of how they should be used, how the disinfectant is going to be used. It should be well designed. And again, they should be scientifically robust. Um, mm -hmm. So for those reasons, if you do use in-house methods, they can come under close scrutiny during inspection. And that's why many end users, so people using the disinfectants in Europe and rest of the world, tend to use modified versions of the EN test methods. Um, 
and the modification is important because the EM methods are not specific to clean rooms. Um, the, the methods that we do use um, are also used in food, industrial, domestic and institutional areas as well. Um, and you can probably, you know, from that sort of wide spectrum, you know, understand that the clean room manufacturing areas um, are quite different. They're maintained in a very clean state. So they're very high starting in Ottoman. Um, the soil conditions, the high levels of re log reduction or the kill that, that are required in those methods may not really be applicable to clean rooms. And if you try and comply with the unmodified standard, it may lead you to start considering chemistries that are more aggressive than you really need, have longer contact times, or even actually um, need to have repeated application in order to achieve the contact time to get the kill, a very high level of kill, which is not ideal in a production scenario. Um, so really end users can, and I would say arguably should, modify standard methods when they use them to better reflect their own conditions. Typically we're talking about their um, modifying the organisms used, so they're your own organisms, modifying the surfaces, the starting inoculum, the contact times, maybe the test temperatures, if you have clean rooms, that, um, cold stores for example, and also modifying the acceptance criteria as well. So yeah, another thing I think based on that actually that people would probably want clarified is what are the recognised acceptance criteria? So what are regulators looking for? What do they want to see? Yeah, so I mean, I think we all know that bio burden uh, is expected to be much lower in clean rooms and other settings. And actually for guidance, it's really worth looking at um, United States Pharmacopeia USP chapter 1072 on uh, disinfectants and antiseptics. And, and in there it states that disinfectant efficacy tests should have realistic acceptance criteria. Um, and it also as well uh, gives you a steer that disinfectants are less effective against the higher numbers of microorganisms used in laboratory challenge tests than they are against the numbers found in clean rooms. So typically we see um, end users using the acceptance criteria for USP and that would be a three log reduction for vegetative bacteria and yeast and a two log reduction for bacterial spores and typically people also apply that to fungal spores as well. Yeah. Yeah. We find that's widely accepted by the regulators. Um, and again, I think it's important just to stress again um, why we're looking at these reduced acceptance criteria, which is that um, pharmaceutical end users aren't just looking at efficacy. So material compatibility and residues can also be important considerations. Mm. Um, you know, you have expensive clean rooms full of critical equipment and you have products that can't be tainted by uh, chemical or particulate contamination from disinfectant residues. So it's another consideration. Mm. So yeah, well, there must be a lot of common problems and hurdles and things that end users can experience with their disinfectant validation. <laughs> can you give us any examples yeah. or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, unfortunately, disinfectant efficacy testing is complex um, and you need to have some experience and know how in order to get it right. Um, and, and sometimes small variations or modifications to a standard method can have unintended consequences. And we see that with customers, you know, uh, not preparing the organisms correctly or, or trying to validate using very rough material surfaces, for example. Um, and not modifying the standard methods, as we've mentioned, to make them more representative, can result in you over-challenging clean room disinfectants. And then, of course, you fail to meet your acceptance criteria. It's easy to spend a lot of time and money trying and then failing to validate disinfectants that may be perfectly suited to maintaining control in your clean rooms. So based on that, do you think this is something that customers could do for themselves or? Yes, <laughs> um, if you've got a suitable laboratory with trained and experienced microbiology biologists, but usually we do encourage end users to use an independent, experienced third party test lab. They can help you draft the protocols, they can perform the testing for you. And again, just a note of caution, if you have a, a tame laboratory, if you like, that you've used before for your water testing, or your finished product testing, um, they may not have sufficient experience. So do make sure if you have a laboratory in mind for the study, um, establish how routinely they do that work. Yeah. Well, I think my final question here is just about what if a end user has multiple sites? Like how do they go about multi-site validation? Yeah, sometimes it is desirable to think about multi-site validation. So um, by doing that, you can make sure that all of your sites are using approved disinfectant suppliers and products. They have suitable validation data in place um, they're all using approved or recognized methodology they all have a kind of well thought out justified um, uh, you know validation plan with parameters and criteria 
Um, so what we often see actually is, is um, companies with multiple sites, you see them collating the different types of organisms and materials at all those different sites. Um, and that can avoid them duplicating, for example, organism material combinations. It's, it's kind of pointless if you have three different sites globally and they all validate staph aureus on stainless steel, you're probably not really gaining a lot from that. Um, so that's a benefit. Uh, Ecolab also have the Validex program, which is essentially an extended uh, package of validation data. Uh, that can help customers avoiding having to test some of the more common organisms or type strain cultures on very common clean room surfaces. So really by combining um, the uh, registration data that's given to you by manufacturers, um, along with any supplementary data they can give you, such as the Validex package from Ecolab, um, and then also looking at the relevant relevant organisms and surface types from across your multiple sites, companies can, can use that to create a test matrix and that shows where data already exists for those combinations of organisms um, and surfaces or where supplementary data needs to be generated. So that matrix approach, if you use that with the Validex package as well, can sort of remove some of that costly time consuming duplication, hopefully streamline your, your validation process and, and really uh, the ideal um, outcome of that is you create a robust, well thought out validation package. Okay. Perfect. Well, I think that's everything I have. I thank you for your time, Matt, and thank you to everyone watching. I hope you found this really informative and have a good day. <laughs>